Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. All right, greetings, saints. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We've been studying um, the Logos Rhema error. When you speak a Rhema to someone, if they don't hold on to it, speak it themselves, until the end, it will not come to pass. That person has to receive it as a Rhema too. You can speak a Rhema, but if they don't receive it as a Rhema, it won't do them any good. You know, the Logos Rhema folks do not know uh, there was no willful disobedience in this person who didn't receive. They think he just didn't get a rhema. But God said in Hebrews 10, 26, and 27, that if you sin willfully after you receive a knowledge of the truth, there remains no sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. He didn't say healing. He said judgment. So they don't know that either. They just say, okay, that person didn't get a rhema. False. That's a false assumption. There may have been no faith. There may have been willful disobedience. It's a false assumption. Okay. And that's their proof. That somebody didn't get healed, they didn't get a rhema. That's ridiculous. If you don't get a rhema, it's your fault, not God's fault. He has spoken a rhema. It was written as a logos. As long as it's on that page as a logos, it's not going to do you any good until you mix faith with it. When you mix faith with it, you hear it. You're one of those that has ears to hear. When you hear it, it's a rhema. Okay. Uh, so these people scoff at the idea that sin or unbelief, which are really synonymous, sin, unbelief is sin, right, has anything to do with the curse having a legal right over people. You know, Jesus healed a man and warned him not to sin or his curse would come back even worse. John 5 and 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. And and for those that say, um, it's not in the atonement, the word made whole here is saved, sozo. Okay. Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing befall thee. Notice that sin, including unbelief, could kill this man even after Jesus prayed for him. Did you see that? He said, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Of course, according to the Logos Rhema doctrine, if this man died later, it would be because it was Jesus' fault. You know, he prayed for him and he did not have a Rhema. That's what they would have said. But because they don't know that the generation that Jesus healed of spirits of infirmity lost what he gave them because they continued in their sins. And that's Matthew 12 and 43 on down. It says, But the unclean spirit, when he's gone out of the man, passeth through waterless places, seeking rest, and findeth it not. Then he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more evil than himself. And they enter in, and dwell there, and the last state of that man becometh worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this evil generation. That evil generation that Jesus was healing and casting the demons out, Because they didn't stop their sin, they didn't fill themselves up with God, became worse. Many of them died of their infirmities. People say, oh, if Jesus prayed for you, that would No, Jesus said, the fact is, they lost it. They lost what he gave them. That's the facts. It was up to them to continue in the rhema. Jesus spoke it. If they didn't hold on to it, it was their fault. And you can get get healed. I just shared the testimony with you earlier 
tonight. You can receive from God. And yet, if you walk by sight, to, by sight, you will lose it. He had opportunity to walk by sight for his microphone. And he refused to walk by sight. And he kept the gift that God gave him. If he would have accepted what he saw, he would have lost it. Would that have been the fault of the person who spoke the word to him? Absolutely not. What he said was still true. You know, because they lost their healings and deliverances that Jesus gave, was it his fault? I was once called to pray for a young girl who was dying of cancer. It had spread through five of her organs, and she was skin and bones, couldn't get out of the bed. And I quoted to her James 5 and 16, you know, confess your sins one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Well, She confessed her sins to her parents, and um, very humbly, when I said that to her, and so I commanded the spirit of cancer to leave her, which it did. She immediately became better and better, and was a picture of health, doing everything that she was doing before, gained all of her weight back, everything, okay? Then... I heard that the parents had given credit for this healing to their idol of herbs. Isn't that something? A creative miracle. And they're going to say, oh, my herbs. You know, this old kid, isn't it wonderful what herbs can do? You know? Yeah, right. And, uh, And that they were unforgiving to one another because they were speaking of divorce. Then suddenly this girl went downhill as fast as she had recovered and she died. I'm sure if some Logos Rhema person was out there, they'd say, okay, you didn't get a Rhema. (laughs) That is ridiculous. You know, the facts, you know, just proved totally otherwise. No, they lost it just like the people lost what Jesus gave them. Jesus taught you didn't need to hear a voice. You just needed to believe that you have received anything and you would receive it. Wow, that's, that's making it easy. Well, that's the way the Lord is. He's making it easy for us to take, partake of the benefits. You know, Mark 11 and 24, this is, this is what he said. Therefore, I say unto you, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received. He didn't say, wait for a word. Believe you received, and you shall have them. That's the condition, not a rhema. Now, did this person get a, when you read Mark 11 and 24 and you believe it, do you get a rhema? Yeah, because you're hearing it. Somebody else is just reading it, dead letter on a page, not doing a bit of good because they don't have any faith. But when you read it with faith, you hear it. And yes, you do get a rhema. So those who falsely judge others for not having a rhema kind of got three fingers pointing back at them for never bringing healing or deliverance to those who are dying with this theology. They are walking in the steps of theologians like Karl Barth, who, among others, passed this theology on down to them and never healed or delivered anybody. He just had a theology, right? Well, get away from people like that. They don't have any fruit. You can't call them believers. Jesus said, these signs will accompany them that believe. Barth wasn't wasn't a believer. He didn't hear. He wasn't getting rhema. He just had a theology. And by the way, he passed on down to them his belief that you can't believe in the literal interpretation of the Scriptures. So you know what kind of theologian he was. The most liberal apostate type, right? But he was a guy that, one of the guys that came up with this Logos rhema thing. And all of the liberal apostate church believes the same thing. It didn't come from spirit-filled Christianity, folks. They believe you don't, you can't believe the literal interpretation of Scripture either. So you can't really just stand on any old logos to receive what it says. That's their thinking. They're unbelievers. They're just plain and simple unbelievers. And that. Some of these people also received Carl's uh, Doctrine of Ultimate Reconciliation of All, which we have an article on our site on that. I hope that some of you out there, if you've got it, you'll 
humble yourself to the word and get delivered of it, so destructive. So they expect you to forget Jesus' warning of an eternal hell for the wicked. On top of their unbelief in the written word, they don't want you to believe that there's an eternal hell. And I've seen for more than 35 years that the effect of this demon doctrine on Christians is that like the eternal security adherents, they no longer fear the word of the Lord. And this, of course, sends many people to hell, not fearing the word of the Lord. Well, there's three sure things that the devil would have you believe. One is, don't believe that you can just ask and believe the word. And two is, don't believe the promises are literally true and for you now. And three is, don't worry about hell, you won't be there long. These are doctrines of demons which pervert the word in, in your mind. You know, in that article, I, I prove that with their own words, that if what they say is true, when the wicked come out of hell, God will die. And you will go straight to hell from heaven. So watch out when this ultimate reconciliation happens and these guys come out of hell, you're going to hell. Because it uses the exact same wording for you as eternal in heaven. So if there's an end of what the Bible calls eternal, you're in big trouble. And God's going to die because he's eternal too. So it's stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And it, you know, these false doctrines never hold up to the rest of Scripture. That's the problem. So yeah, you find people that believe in the Logos Rhema. You might find a bunch of them that believe in that too. <laughs> you know, Jesus spoke to him that hath eyes to see and ears to hear. The emphasis was not on God speaking, but on the person's hearing. While the Logos Rhema folks are waiting for a voice, the wise are reading the Logos, hearing what was spoken, and it becomes a Rhema of God to them. And then they turn and they speak that rhema. And they have the power of creation in their mouth when they do that. Because they are representatives of the Son of God. Otherwise, the logos on the page is just totally useless. As it is to most people. The overwhelming majority of people out there in the world who read the Bible get nothing from it and they don't begin to be disciples. They don't begin to walk it, talk it, think it. Because they don't have ears to hear. So it's like reading a pretty book, you know. I mean, that's, that's about all there is to it. And, um, you know, the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance everything that He spoke as a rhema to us. The person who has this experience can't be deceived by theologians. They got an argument. They got no experience of consistent personal healing. If you want healing or anything from God, go to those people who get results. Don't go to the theologians. And learn from them how to receive. And I tell you, yeah, I, I like what Jesus said. Father, I thank you that you've revealed this unto babes. You've hidden it from the wise and prudent, and you've hidden, revealed it unto babes. Children, baby Christians, know that this doctrine's stupid. But the theologians don't. And they're not getting anything, and they've got no fruit. And they will talk you out of having ears to hear and, and a mouth to speak, your rhema. They say 1 Peter 2.24, like this one that was criticizing me, is not for physical healing. Uh hmm. You know, who his own self bear our sins in his body upon the tree, that we, having died unto sins, might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So that's not for physical healing, right? That's what they say. Well, that's what all the dead, you know, Christians out there that aren't filled with the Spirit and don't believe the Word of God, that's what they say. 
The old mainline denominations, they all say that. They say this quotes from Isaiah 53 is not about physical healing. But Matthew also quoted Isaiah 53 and showed it clearly was physical healing. Verse 16, Matthew 8 and 16. And when even was come, they brought unto him many possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all, all that were sick. You mean he got a word for all of them? <laughs> yeah. It was the same word in the beginning. I give you authority, right? And this, and this happened that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our diseases. So plainly he's saying here that that is absolutely for physical healing because that's what Jesus was doing with that Isaiah text. So they're wrong. And they say it's not an atonement. But don't make any difference because people are getting healing from it. You know, they're, they're too late to stop millions of believers through the centuries from getting healing through that verse. And can you imagine that God is answering their faith in that verse if it was a lie? The very fruit proves to you that that verse is for physical healing because so many people get healed from it. More than any other verse, I think, probably. So the very fruit tells you that verse means just what it says. Why do they want to destroy it? They have a theology. They have to prove themselves right. They're theologians. Their great wisdom is what's important. They're very proud of what they know. But look at their fruit. These signs shall accompany them that believe They'll lay hands on sick, and they shall recover. So don't mess with them, because they don't know nothing. You know, don't mess with them. Get away from them. They're, doing, they're there from the devil to destroy your faith. The Logos Rhema lies are destroying the faith of many to receive their gift from God. And all you got to do is read it, and you can see that it was already given anyway. You can't take something back if it's already given. The proof is in the fruit. And this, this lie would rob you of that. The unspirit-filled would agree with this unbelief because they have no experience with healing and um, have to make some kind of excuse why they don't get it. I mean, obviously, if you're trying to draw people to your religion, your group, what we believe, there has to be a reason why. Well, what's the matter with you? Jesus said, these signs will accompany them that believe. How come you don't have any signs? Oh, well, we haven't gotten an arema. <laughs> Another excuse, you know. Or that passed away with the apostles, you know. Or, you know, another excuse, you know. They have to give an excuse. Because they're saying they're Christians. But they got no proof. See? If they don't just believe that um, by the stripes of Jesus they've already been healed, then they won't be healed because they refuse Jesus' command to confess me before men. They're rejecting the Logos. They don't have ears to hear the Logos. You know, Jesus commanded us to confess him before men. That word confess means speak the same as. We don't have any example of Jesus telling us, you got to get a rhema from God or you can't have this. No, he said, oh, all you got to do is believe it. When you speak what Jesus said in the Logos, that's the rhema. You, you notice in, um, in the verses above, God said you were healed because he took our infirmities and bare our diseases. And they're all past tense. So you're not waiting on anything but to believe that it was already done. That's the gospel. That's the good news. You don't have to do it. You don't have to wait for it. You get it now. It's yours. You stand on the word. You believe by faith. You have received. Jesus said, everything you pray for, Mark 11, 24, everything you pray for, believe you received it. And you shall have it. Why? Because it all happened at the cross already. You're not waiting for a rhema. 
When you believe it, it is a rhema. We're waiting for no more word to receive our benefit. The Bible says, Let God be true and every man a liar. The condition to receive deliverance from the curse is not hearing a voice in the future. The condition is hearing the gospel from the past. Romans 1.16 again, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, not every one that heareth a word. You're not waiting on that. You just have to believe the word that's already been spoken. Jesus already bore the curse of all sickness, and it's enumerated in the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 28. Galatians 3 and 13, Christ redeemed us, past tense, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that upon the Gentiles might come the blessings of Abraham in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So when you hear God's Logos, it has spoken to your spiritual ears. So while the Logos Rhema cult are waiting for a voice from heaven, which rarely comes, and they miss out, true believers are hearing the Rhema when God spoke it in the past and getting their promised provisions. God can't change his mind. When he says something, and he changes his mind, that's a lie. Now, you may not meet the condition of faith, which is believing you have received at the cross, and therefore you cannot have the benefit because you have no rhema. God says, if his word is in you, you can ask anything you desire, and you will receive. John 15 and 7. If you abide in me and my words, Rama, abide in you. Now, how do you get that inside of you? Listen, listen to what he said. If you abide in me and my words, which is Rama, abide in you. Ask whatever you will, it shall be done unto you. Notice it's not God's will by whether he speaks to you that you are healed, but your will created by his word in your heart. Now you know why these people don't receive what they desire. They do not abide in Christ, nor are his words in them. You know, if you don't respect the Logos, if you don't respect the literal word of God, you don't believe the literal word of God is to be respected, which is exactly what they say, then you don't ever have a rhema. And you're going to do without. If, like Karl Barth, you do not believe the promises are literally true and that you cannot literally interpret the New Testament, you'll get no rhema because you don't hear it. You're a closet unbeliever. You know, it's impossible to talk Scripture with such people because you have no foundation to stand on in their eyes or their ears. What do you mean? Well, you can you can talk with them, but you've got no way to convert them because they don't respect the Word of God that you respect. If they don't, first of all, believe that the written Word is for us today, it's real, it's true, it's so powerful that when you believe it, you get it. If they don't believe that, you can't do much for them. They're not yet believers. If the Jews spiritually interpreted their covenant while they were still under it and didn't abide by what was written, they were transgressors. And it's the same in the New Testament. You can't spiritualize away what is written while under this new covenant. There is a true spiritual revelation behind much of the New Testament, but it will never destroy what is written unless what is written is clearly an allegory as in the book of Revelation. God doesn't send 
those who do not rightly divide the word of truth. You know, on our website are hundreds of voluntarily sent in testimonies of different healings, deliverances, provisions, etc., 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 most of which are results of our teachings or our prayers. And we only started posting these a few years ago, and only a small percentage take the time to actually write up a testimony and send it in. And these people, by the way, they turn to their family and they show them this miracle and they start the ball rolling in their lives too. So many other people receive from these people who have learned to receive. It's kind of like a geometric effect, right? So the actual manifestation of God's promises during this time were in the thousands, not the hundreds, the thousands. And if you count the past, even more. So we've seen thousands of people enter into this fruit by believing the teaching and the testimonies. Many, many people have told me they've received healing just by reading Sovereign God, for instance, or listening to the real good news. They've been healed. They've been able to heal their children, their wife, their family. They... Uh, it just keeps on going and going and going. So why would anybody listen to a person who has no experience in healing people? If a doctor never showed some semblance of healing, would anybody with common sense go to him? Well, since I was a year old in the Lord, I have received word of knowledge and word of wisdom as the Lord wills. And these are what people call rhema words from God. I agree. Although these came from many different purposes, usually specific direction, like what will happen or where or when to go here or there, um, it's these things are not written in the Word, so we need to pray for a rhema from God for such things. But when you've got something plainly written in the Word, of God, that it's yours, that it's already yours, it's already been given to you, then God holds you responsible to believe that. And if you don't believe that, you probably will never get a word from God. Covenant, benefits, guaranteed, like healing, deliverance, provision, etc., etc., are already given. And only an unbeliever would repetitively ask for something that's already given. You know, these people are asking, asking, asking because they're waiting for their rhema. They're waiting for God to speak in their spirit or in their mind or in their ear. And they don't get it. Most of these people, you ask them, have you ever had? Oh, yeah, it happened to me. I remember <laughs> once. once. <laughs> you know, these people are fond of saying that Moses and the prophets needed specific words for their direction, which, which is, of course, true. Absolutely. But this has nothing to do with what's already promised as a fact. So they're just leading you on a goose chase with that argument because it has nothing to do with that. I've received word knowledge and wisdom many times about certain directions, certain things, certain happenings, something that's going to happen, you know, these kind of things, something that isn't specifically written in the Word. It's happened to me many times. So I know what it sounds like. But I can tell you that when I'm coming up to a believer and he's repented of his sins, that person is guaranteed healing, deliverance, provision, all these things from God. It's in his word. All they have to do is believe it. And I can say to them, hey, brother, don't you know you were healed? Now, I'm giving him a rhema. He don't have to believe that. Or he may start out believing that and not continue to believe it. And he'll still lose it. Now, that don't mean the person that gave the rhema is wrong. But that's what these Logos Rhema people do. They'll blame the person that gave Oh, you didn't get a rhema. See, I told you this was true. <laughs> I told you this doctrine was right. That's the kind of goofy circular reasoning that they have. I can tell you that God has rarely ever told me that someone has been healed or is healed or whatever you know as a he never had to tell me that 
I just believe what the Bible says. You don't have to tell me that. I would, I would be ashamed if he'd have to tell me that. It's like, what? Have you been with me this long and you don't believe the Bible? I'd be ashamed if God had to tell me that. Now, he has to tell me other things. Sometimes he has to tell me, well, you know that this person needs to repent of such and such. He's done that with for me before because I wouldn't have known that. But I do know that this person, being a, a child of God, is entitled to this benefit, and I am entitled to give it to them if they just believe. That's the only condition. I'm entitled to give it to them, and they're entitled to receive it if they just believe. I'm not going to tell them you have to wait for God to tell you that what he already told you is true. That's goofy. But that's the doctrine, and it traps a lot of people. And they don't realize that this is just garbage doctrine. When Jesus said, it is finished, Concerning the covenant, concerning everything that he paid for us, you know, he meant it. You're not waiting on anything. He didn't say if you get a word, you can receive it. But he said, if you have faith, you shall receive. Matthew 21 and 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, that's the condition. You shall not only say, do un what is done unto the fig tree, but even if you say unto this mountain, be thou taken up and cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. What is the condition there? Why are they putting extra conditions in there? All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. That was the only condition. They're saying things the Bible doesn't say. They're adding to the Word of God. A curse is pronounced on a person who adds to the Word of God. The last four verses of the book. I had somebody tell me the other day, well, wait a minute, David, that's, that was the book of Revelation. But don't you know that the book of Revelation was never meant to be a book of its own. It was meant to be a book joined to many other books. The 66 books are all joined together by a numeric pattern. The last four verses of the book are also joined to the book. There was no independent book of Revelation. If you take the book of Revelation away from the rest of the books, you break a pattern that joins book to book to book. So you see some people say, oh, that you can't, that's just for the book of Revelation. No, it's not. It's for the whole book. If you add to his words, he'll add to you the plagues that are written in this book. And so when they tell you you got to wait to get a word from heaven, they're adding to the word of God. And look at the curse they're living under. If you don't believe it, just look at the curse they're living under. Right? All things whatsoever. Not just when you receive a word. Anybody that says they have to wait and receive a word from God, they're totally carnal and double-minded. They're not believing what he's already said. Many, like I said, many saints never hear a word from God that they recognize as a word from God. And they would never receive. All of their life they'd never receive. <laughs> and that's all because of the Logos Rhema delusion, you know, in some cases. This is a deadly doctrine. Thank God, many with their childlike faith just believe the simple gospel and receive and, and ignore the theologians who want to make this complicated. Remind you of 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve in his craftiness, your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity and the purity that is toward Christ. You know, except you become as a child, right? You shall in no wise enter the kingdom, Jesus said. Children just understand all things whatsoever. You shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Children can understand that. Theologians can't. They say, it's got to be a catch somewhere. You know, they're just unbelievers. That's the problem. 
I've sent my children, you know, when they were little, to go and lay hands and pray over washing machines and refrigerators and squirrels and people and lawnmowers and and command the storms and rains and and they just obeyed me and they saw miracles. I don't know that God spoke to any of them except He spoke through me. And uh, they just went and obeyed their daddy and it happened. And I'm so glad that no theologians got to them to complicate their minds. The simplicity that stores Christ. You know, the simple-mindedest men, Jesus picked these these um, fishermen and tax collectors. He, it was no theologians. He didn't pick the theologians. You know, ah, he picked Paul, I know, but he had to prove he could do it, right? Uh, but he had to count everything he learned in the seminary as dung before God could use him. He had to become a simple man. And so, learn from your children. I, I would rather have children pray over me than a lot of grown-ups, I'll tell you the truth. Because they just accept it. Daddy said it, it's true. You know, they just accept it. It's that simple. Obviously, they hear from God. Obviously, they're getting a rhema, you know. But why are they getting a rhema? Because they're just simple. They're just accepting it because Daddy said it, right? You know, the Logos Rhema people like to, to misuse a verse in John 5 and 30 to say that Jesus had to get permission to heal everyone or anyone. And it says, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge. But what did he hear just before this verse? He heard this, and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is a son of man. Folks, any way you slice it, when you got authority, you got authority. God is saying, okay, you go and do it. I'm giving it to you. You go. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. And what did they do? They did just that. They weren't waiting to hear nothing. They had already heard it. They heard it from the Logos. Jesus Christ. So they heard the Logos. And they went and spoke the rhema. Praise God. And, uh, you know, so many are missing out on this simplicity of this wonderful, awesome privilege of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus healed because he heard the Father give him authority to do it. And if you have authority, you don't keep going back to the one who gave it as though he didn't give it. And you didn't believe him. What gives these people the right to speak as though they are an authority on healing and able to judge others when they aren't being used to heal people? Paul said he dared not do such a thing. He said it in Romans 15 and 18. He says, For I will not dare to speak of any things save those which Christ hath wrought through me. For the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about even unto Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. That's where your full gospel comes from, right there. So he said, Hey, if God's not doing it through me, I'm not going to preach it. So what are these people doing? There are authorities on healing with no fruit. And Paul said, I dare not do this. You see, they have to throw out much of the word to believe something that hasn't worked for them. They believe Paul's thorn was a sickness. So we can't hope to have healing just by God's promises. But the Word says differently. There ain't nothing in the Bible about his thorn being a sickness. He called it a messenger of Satan. 
He never said you couldn't be healed. He was the guy that said you could be healed. And he didn't use the word infirmity in that text either. He used the word weakness. It's the same word where it says the weakness of God is stronger than man. Not the infirmity of God. You never saw God with any infirmity. It's the same word. See, so they they picked uh, a very poor translation of part of the King James to make their theology and didn't even look into it. The truth is it didn't say anything about him having an infirmity. It said he was weak. And in the text before, the chapter before, he told you all these places where he became weak. You know, when he was attacked by the, the Jews. You know, when he was uh, lost in the sea. and In other words, when you get in a situation that's bigger than you are, you're weak. And when you're weak, then are you strong? That's what Paul said. Because you can't do it. See, when you can do it, you generally will. And if you'll do it, God's not going to do it. Because his power is made perfect in weakness. That's the word that they generally like to translate infirmity. Well, weakness doesn't have anything to do with infirmity. It's a bad translation. So they love these doctrines to try to destroy your faith because they have to prove themselves right. What would you think of a person that would sacrifice your well-being in order to prove themselves right? That may send you to an early grave in order to prove themselves right? You wouldn't think much of them, would you? Their doctrine has killed many, and it'll kill them. You know, Mark 16 and 17 says, And these signs shall accompany them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. John 14 and 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. No one should be judged a believer in what the Bible says about healing, who has no signs following. Those who hear and believe what the Father says in His Word will speak the rhema and bring healing to many people. You know, Jesus said, John seven thirty eight, He that believeth on me as the Scripture hath said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit that they that believed on him were to receive. Rivers of living water coming out of that. What is that? That's healing. That's deliverance. That's blessing. That's provision. That's fixing microphones. So those who don't believe what the Scripture or the writings, you know, Scripture is the word writings. Those who do not believe what the writings, that's the Logos say they're not going to have any rhema and they won't speak any healings. You know, the the inexperienced, immature, or unfaithful in this regard have no right to speak against the brethren. They don't have any fruit. They got no right to act as an expert and speak against the brethren. James 4 and 11 says, Speak not one against another brethren. He that speaketh against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law. And judges the law. But if thou judges the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. They have told others that they are correcting me for my false doctrine. You know, James and Paul spoke against those who made themselves judges of their brothers concerning doctrines, but they hadn't sinned. You know, Romans 14 and 1 says, But him that is weak in the faith receive ye, yet not for decisions of scruples. One man hath faith to eat all things, but he that is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth 
set at naught him that eateth not. And let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judges the servant of another? To his own Lord he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be made to stand, for the Lord hath power to make him stand. You notice that the apostles refused to judge those who were doctrinally wrong, giving them time to grow in their faith, and, and we've all obviously needed that. They did judge those who judged them and those who willfully sinned, and so should we. Jesus judged as hypocrites those who judged others when they were not right themselves. And obviously, if you look at the fruit, you know they're not right. And they're not even acting as believers. You know, Matthew 7 and 1, it says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? So here's somebody without any fruit judging somebody that does have fruit and healing like they're an expert, right? And judging them that their doctrine is wrong. So they shouldn't be having this fruit, right? They shouldn't be healing people or delivering people or bringing because their doctrine's wrong. It shouldn't work. Why is it working? <laughs> you know? Jesus said, How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me cast out the mote out of thine eye, and lo, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast thy moat out of thy brother's eye. Right? And that's what's going on out there a lot, folks. You know, when, when Jesus opposed even the Pharisees, he never named them like these people do. He spoke against their principles in a general way, you'll notice. Uh, John named names once against a man who railed at him because he was just seeking his own preeminence, right? Third John 9, I wrote somewhat unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Therefore, if I come, I will bring to remembrance his works which he doeth, prating against us with wicked words. So you see, John rebuked the guy that was just seeking preeminence and railed against him. And Paul spoke names against, once, I think, against two men who had defiled their conscience and lost the faith because of speaking against others. 1 Timothy 1.19 Behold, faith and a good conscience, excuse me, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having thrust from them, made shipwreck concerning the faith, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they might be taught not to blaspheme. You know, the Greek we, meaning of the word blaspheme here means to speak against. And it can be speaking against God or it can be speaking against your fellow man. You know, very similar words used in scriptures are railing and reviling, which means to speak abusively about or to someone. Paul said to avoid those who did such things. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. But as it is, I wrote unto you not to keep company if any man that is named a brother be a, a reviler. And he goes on to say, with such a one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do with judging them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Put away the wicked man from among yourselves. Put away the reviler. Put away the blasphemer. The one that's always speaking against the brethren, naming brethren, 
judging them for their doctrines. He's saying, put away from them, get away from them, put them away from you. The only examples that we have from Scripture for naming the names of offenders is when they are sinning by speaking against others for their own ego's sake. That's the only examples we got. These people have done just this, you know, when they've railed at me. You know, to them, God says, being in readiness to avenge all disobedience when your obedience is made full. Who are they to judge their brother for their doctrines? They never, never read Romans chapter 14, I'm sure. You know, these same people have tried several times to get me to believe this doctrine and were somewhat offended that, that I have not given in, so they retaliate. If that wasn't true, why would they pick me to single out and not the millions of others who deny their doctrine and are getting results because of it? And why would they revile me in emails to others who have tried to correct them and then told me about it? You know, these people and millions more have done without and died and gone to an early grave because of this false doctrine. You know, um, you can judge by the fruit. When I was a baby Christian, I didn't know how to answer these people when they said such things. But I could look at the fruit. That was the first thing I looked at. It was almost like the Lord said, Well, wait a minute. Is he getting healing? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they weren't. Were they giving it to anybody else? Well, no, they weren't. I remember we um, came upon some people that um, heard the voice of God. They heard it all the time. They heard it in their right ear. <laughs> and, and we says, oh yeah, what does he say? <laughs> and boy, when they started telling us what God said, we say, wait a minute. I, I've been reading this word for a while, and it don't say that. It says this. And finally, we figured out these people had demons, you know. So we offered them, look, you don't have anything to lose if you let us pray over you, right? And I mean, we couldn't cast out God, could we? <laughs> so they said, yeah. So that was kind of like a challenge to them. They said, yeah, that's right, so... So we prayed over them, and they never heard the voice of God again. And I always laughed about that. You know, after we prayed over them, that voice left them. I said, you can't cast out God, can you? You know, voice left them. And, and they got some wisdom after that. But they were hearing this voice. You know, there's a demon that, it, there are lots of demons that um, impersonate God. That's why when people say the Spirit, Watch out, <laughs> unless that spirit's in agreement with the Logos. Hold them to the written word. So many of them are dying now. It's amazing, astounding. They're just dying because they're, they very well believe that voice. They got lots of faith in that voice. But that voice don't have the power to heal and deliver and save. It's just an idol. And the Lord Jesus, the Lord God in the Old Testament too, said basically that he wasn't going to answer for no idol. So these people listening to these voices and following diligently these voices and, and falling into all kinds of corruption, because don't you know those voices aren't going to lead you to holiness or success or to cast out demons or to heal the sick. Satan don't cast out Satan. So, judge the fruit. Look at the fruit. See what it's doing for them. If it's not helping them, it ain't going to help you either. And if they're not having signs of believers that Jesus said, well, what makes them a teacher? You know, who gave them authority to teach? Paul said he didn't dare teach something that God wasn't working through him. That's what we call hypocrisy, you know.
Don't pay any attention to them. Well, thank you so much for joining the saints, and uh, we love you, and we bless you in Jesus' name, and um, we'll do this again sometime. Good night. For information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.